What's going on guys, this is Junior here and today I'm going to show you how to Dakarize an Angular application. This is the application that we have built so far and it's the one that we're going to use to Dakarize. And if you want to know how we actually built this application, you can just check out the videos on the channel, then you will know how we started working on this application and how we built it from scratch literally adding all the functionalities that you see here. So I'm in my profile right now and I can update my information. If I click here, I can just change anything that I want here and then I can update it. You can see that I have a notification and then the account activity is popping up here. And I can also change my password, give the current password and then pass in a new password. I can change my authorization so I can change my role. So if I change my role to admin, for example, and then I click update, you'll see that my role will be updated and also the permissions will change. And if you notice, you see that I don't have the delayed permission for customers and users back to role sysadmin, which is the highest permission. And then I save that information again, then you'll see that my permission will be updated you can see now i have the delete permission so i can delete customer and i can delete user and i can also update my account information so if my account is locked and if it's active and also authentication so if i want to show the logs as you can see here i can just click on this checkbox and it will disappear or appear and i can also enable multi-factor authentication so if i enable multi-factor authentication when i'm gonna log in it's gonna send me a text message with a code that i'll need to put in but i'm gonna go ahead and disable that because i wanna i don't wanna have to go through this when Whenever I'm logging in and I can also update my profile picture. So if I change this picture here, it will change here as well as in the nav bar. And also if I go back to the homepage, I can manage all of these customers. So I can go to this first customer, for example, then I can update their information. If I need to, I can add a new customer so I can do new customer and then I can pass in the customer information. I can see all the customers again and I can sort them and I can also add a new invoice. You know, I can select the customer and then pass in the inference information, the data, etc. And I can also see all of the invoices. As of right now, I don't have any invoice. So it's an application that we build to manage customers and their invoices. And we can also manage our account. And that's what I showed you in the beginning. So we can go here and then manage our account. So that's the application that we're going to be Dakarizing. So let's go ahead and work on that right now. So let's go back to the code of the front end. And the first thing we need to do is to create a Docker file. So I'm going to right click here or you can click on this icon right here and then create a new file. So here we're going to create the Docker file. So Docker file. OK, and for the Docker file, it's actually going to be pretty simple uh, because we're just going to need a node image and then copy everything inside of a Nginx web server. So I'm going to say from we want to get node. If you want to know what version of node that you want to have here, you can just Google it and see what the latest version is. Or you can just leave node like if you leave it like this, it will just get you the latest version, which is fine in a lot of cases. But the reason that you might not want to do this is because if you keep this file like this or so the Docker file, if you just keep it with just from node, which means every time it's going to get the latest version of node, then it might break something in your application. So if there is a new version of Node.js and there is breaking changes, then it's going to break your application because it's going to get the latest version. So it's best to specify a version that you know your application works with just fine so that you don't have to worry about a new version breaking your application. And if you just want to know what you need to do here, I can just go back and then I can just say node JS, just Google it and then go to the official node version and you can see it's 18.17.1, which is the long term support. So we can just pass in this number as the version of node that we want to have in our application because that's the version that I have in my computer. And I know that with this version, the application is working just fine. There's nothing uh, that is broken. OK, so that's the that's usually what you want to do. You want to specify the version that, you know, your application works with just fine so that later version of node doesn't introduce breaking changes in your application. So now we can just say we know that our application is going to run with version 18.17.1 and we can get uh, an Alpine uh, version of that, which is just going to be like a smaller build for that particular image. And then we're going to sign it as a build. OK, so we're just defining a reference to this entire thing so that we can just copy the files that we need. So very similar to what we did in the back end. And then I'm going to define a working directory. So I'm going to say uh, word there and then I'm just going to define this as app. 
And the reason I like to define a working directory is because if I need to go inside of the running container, then I know exactly um, what folder I need to go to to see the file that I'm going to copy inside. And then here we're just going to say uh, after that we want to copy the package.json file. So I'm going to say package that and then we're going to put a well, I have to put a star first because we also need the lag file and then that JSON. So it's going to copy both the package.json file and the package dash lag file. So this other file here, this one, right? Okay, maybe I should just leave this open in this situation. And then we're just going to say that forward slash, which means it's going to copy it inside of this working directory because Everything we do now from this point forward, like everything we copy, they will go inside of the working directory that we define. And then after that, we're going to run npm install so that we can install all of the uh, node module dependencies. And then after that, um, there's a very important command that we need to run, and that's the npx ngcc. And then we're going to say properties, and I want the ES2023. Okay, so we're going to say 2023 and browser module main. And then we want to do first only and also dash dash create that IV that entry that points. Okay, and I have to explain what this command is doing. But before I do that, let me start from the beginning. So we're saying we need the node version 18.17.1 Alpine, which is just a smaller bundle of this version of node. And then we're going to give it an alias, which is going to be build. The reason we're going to give it an alias is because we're going to ditch this part of the building of the image and then just copy the result of this entire process. So we're going to need this name to reference this build and then copy the file that we want and then put it in another nginx image or container whenever we run the container because ultimately we don't want a node image as the base of this image but we want an nginx okay so maybe when it's done uh, i'm gonna go over it again then it's gonna make more sense so we say get us this version of node we're gonna give it an alias of build we're gonna define this directory which is just a folder we're gonna copy the package.json also the package-lock.json into this app that's what this dot forward slash means. And then after we have the package.json files and the package dash lock file, we're going to install the dependency. So we're going to run npm install. And then after we do that, we're going to run this command. And this is the command that I really need to go over so that you understand what it's doing. Now, you don't really need to do this, but it's just the safest as of right now. So you're in a better position when you pass in this command than when you do not. And so what exactly is this command doing? So what this is doing is fairly simple but it's just a very long command so we're running so that's coming from docker so this run here so all the ones in blue and capital letters they're a keyword coming from docker so docker is going to run this command and the npx is also coming from the node package manager it actually stands for the node package executor so what this means is it's simply a package runner so everything that exists in the npm registry we can just execute that using the npx. And the, what we want to execute in this case is the ngcc. So, so far, so good. We're invoking this node package executor, which is going to allow us to execute some command or execute some package that is available in the npm registry. And in this case, that's the ngcc. So you can already see the ng here, which gives you a hint about something being of the Angular CLI. And if I put a space here, you can see that just that's just the ng command and then cc, which stands for the Angular. So the ng here, you can just say that's the Angular command or the CLI prefix. And the cc is the compatibility compiler for Angular. So the ngcc, which is the Angular compatibility compiler, is a tool used to compile libraries that have been published in the legacy format. And you use this when these libraries are, are not compatible with the Angular IV runtime so that you can format them to, uh, to a format that is compatible compatible with the IV that you can see that I'm um, mentioning here. Now, I don't want to get into all these details of the IV and all that, but I really want you to understand what this means and why we need to do this. So that's what this two parts are doing. And the properties flag, 
which you can see here because you have the dash dash. So that means this is a flag. It's just specifying the uh, format. So all the packages will be processed in this ES23, which is just the ECMAS script 2023, which is just a version of JavaScript. So we want the 2023 and the browser module as main. And the first only flag means that NGCC is going to process the first property that it finds in the package.json. Otherwise, it will just process everything or all, all the format in JavaScript. So think Things like ES 2015 or ESM 2015, like there's a default value that it will use. So that's why we're overriding it with this dash dash first only. And this create IV entry point, that's just going to tell the NGCC command to create new properties for the IV generated entry instead of overriding the previous one. So that's what this flag is doing. And all this command is doing as a whole is to make sure that it takes non IV libraries and generate files that IV can understand. And this is really just a browser thing so that the JavaScript file generated when we run ng build to build this application so that they can be compatible with most browsers. So that's why we're doing this command here. But don't worry too much about it. Just understand that it's somewhat important so far at the time of recording this video, which is in September 2023, then you it's safer to do this than not to do it. And then we want to copy everything else. So we're going to say copy that and then that. So copy all the rest of all the other files. So all of this is going to be copied inside of the app folder. And then lastly, we're going to run npm, oops, not in npm run build. So you might be asking, where is this commit coming from? So if I open the packet.json, you can see when we run the npm run build, then it's going to run the ng build, which is going to build the application. It's going to create a folder named secure capita. So whatever the name of the application is, it's going to create that folder here. And it's going to put all the build file inside of this folder by this name. And I'm going to run this command uh, in just a moment so that you can see the result of it. So that is the first part of the build. That's what you call a multi-stage build uh, Docker file. So after that, what we want to do, we want to go and get an image for Nginx. So we're going to say Nginx and then we want to get the stable version of Nginx. And then we want to copy from, so we're going to copy from what we define up there. So we're going to say from the build because everything we did up until this point, we don't really need it anymore. We just need the result of running this command. So we're going to say we're going to copy this time we're copying from build. So copying from everything we just did here. And we want to copy from inside of the app folder. We want to copy everything that we have inside of this name here. And this is all going to make sense in a second. And we want to copy this inside of the USR share and then nginx forward slash HTML. So for the nginx web server, you want to serve your static files inside of this folder. So that's nginx stuff. So this is coming from nginx and we're just copying all of the file that resulted from this build that we know that will be located inside of the secure capita app. How do we know that's going to be the folder? Because when you run ng build, it's going to look at the name of the project and then put all the files inside of this folder. So we go inside of the app. That's what we're working with from the build. That's why we define from build and then copy everything and then place them inside of the Nginx folder for serving static resources. In this case, that's USR share Nginx slash HTML. And then lastly, we want to expose port 80. Oops. Expose. Okay, so you know this is a web server serving HTTP, and that is done well. It's not always done over port 80, but the default is port 80, and that's just to serve the static files that are going to be generated from running npm run build. So hopefully, this is coming together, and we're going to continue in the next lecture. So you guys know that inside of the Docker container, we're going to be copying everything as you can see on line six here. But we know that we never want to copy this big, huge file that contains all of our dependencies and the dependencies of these dependencies because this file is huge. That's part of the reason we have the package.json file because we define all of our dependencies here so that we can install them again with npm install. So what that means is that whenever we're going to copy everything over inside of the container or to create the image, we know that we don't want to copy this node modules folder. So what we're going to do is to define another file call that Docker, oops, Docker ignore. So this file is similar to a git ignore file. And here we're going to define everything we don't want to be copied 
whenever we're running this copy command. So whenever we're going to copy stuff from our local computer to the to inside of the container, then it's going to look at this file and then it's going to skip everything that would define inside of this file. So for example, node underscore modules will go into that file because we never want to copy this huge folder inside of our container because whenever we run npm install, then it's going to just reinstall them again. Uh, reaching out to the internet and then recreate this folder. So we never want to copy this folder anywhere. We only want to run npm install and then that's going to read our JSON file or the packet.json file and it's going to install all of these dependencies. So we're going to pass this in there. There's other things that you can pass in there. So things like that git or the license or readme file. So everything that you really don't want to copy over to the container, then you would pass them inside of this file. So what I'm going to do is to just give you a standard Docker ignore file that you can use for Node.js. So I'm going to just select this and then paste it in here. And all this is doing is, is just passing in the files and folders that we never want to copy over inside of the container. So you can see distribution, node module, that git folder, readme, license, etc. And you can put whatever really you want inside of this. So for example, if I didn't want to copy this editor config file, I could just pass it in here. So this is no big deal. So that's the Docker ignore file, really very important because otherwise, whenever we're going to try to build an image from this Docker file, copying this huge file is going to make it slow. So you might think that there's something wrong with your um, Docker file, but but in reality, it's just this file is so big and we never want to do that. So that's what this is doing. OK, so you can just keep this for all of your node uh, projects. You just paste it in and then you should be good to go whenever you're creating a Docker file. So that's it for the Docker ignore file. It's similar to a git ignore file. So this file that you can see here. So everything that we don't want to push to a git repository, we're just going to place it in here. That's literally the same idea, but for Docker, as you can see. Okay, so that's what we have to do for the Docker ignore file. The next thing that I want to show you is what's going to happen when we run this ng uh, or npm run build command. Okay, I want to show you what's going to happen to the application whenever we run this command so that you understand why we're copying from this folder and then placing everything inside of the nginx folder. So let's go ahead and work on that next. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up the terminal and I'm going to do control C. I'm also going to show you how we're going to get rid of all of these uh, warnings because I know I've been saying this for a while now, but before I'm going to clear the screen and you can either do ng build that will do the same thing. And the reason this will work is because we have the Angular CLI installed. So if you go inside of the packet.json and we go to our uh, script. So if you do ng build, then you will just do this, run this build, or you can do npm run build as the same thing. So let's go back to the terminal and we're going to do ng build or npm run build. It's the same thing. So I'm going to run this and we're just going to give it a second to finish. And it's over, but it wasn't successful. OK, so you can see here it tries to generate the bundles. And then at the very bottom, it says we didn't meet the budget, so the maximum budget. And what this error means is that we are watching how big the bundles are. And there's a default configuration in the Angular application that sets the size of the bundle to a certain number. And what that means is that whenever we're going to build the project like we're doing here with the ng build, if the bundles are bigger, than what we define in the configuration, then it's going to give us this message. So this is just a nice way that you can keep watch on your Angular application bundle size. OK, so let's go ahead and just change that real quick. So if I go back to the um, Angular application, I can go inside of the Angular.json file. And if I scroll down, oh, there it is. So you can see here we have this budget. It's an array and you can define the initial. So the initial is what fails because it's 1 MB. I think it was bigger than that. Yeah, so budget's 1 MB, but was not met by 50.58 kilobytes. So that means it was more than one. So what we can do, I mean, this isn't really a big deal for me, but some people are really careful about how big the bundle size are because that can affect their performance. But in my case, I don't really care about this too much. So I'm going to make sure everything is like at least two. So I'm going to change everything here to two megabyte. OK, because I don't really care too much about this budget thing. Or if you want, you can just get rid of it altogether if your application is not big. But it's a good thing to use if you have a big team and a lot of people are working on the same application so that you make sure that you control to some degree the performance of your application by looking at the bundle size. 
because the bundle size is important for the initial load of the application. Whenever the application is loading, the browser is going to download all these bundles. So if these bundles are too big, then the app is going to be slow because the browser is going to need to take more time to download these bundles. And if the user internet is not very good, then it can take a very long time. And that's just going to make the user experience even worse. So that's what this is. So now let's go back and just run this command again. Going to bring back the terminal, going to clear the screen and then run ng build it and just give it a second to finish. Okay, so it's over. And this time you can see that everything was successful. And if we go back now to the application and let's close all these files and go back here, you can see now we have this distribution. So this distribution folder was created. And if we open it, we have a folder by the same name of the application. So you can see secure capita and then it has all of the static files that were generated. So these are the files that we're going to copy uh, if I open the Docker file, so we're going to copy all of these files, as you can see here, inside of the Nginx HTML folder. And also we need to pass in distribution here. So the IST forward slash, okay, because they're inside of this distribution folder inside of this secure capita, which is the name of the application, like this name that is defined in the packet.json file, this name right here. Okay, so these are the same right here. Okay, you can see we're targeting these files we're copying them over to the nginx server so what this means is that whenever we complete all of this we get node we create this folder copy the package.json file install of the dependencies run this command for compatibility copy everything else and then run the npm run build which is going to do exactly ng build and it's going to create these files for us and then we're going to say from this first phase so from all of this which will result in this folder being created with these files. We're going to copy everything from the app that distribution. So the app is the working directory because that's where everything is copied. And we want to go to distribution, secure capita, which is going to give us access to all these files. And then we're going to copy everything over to the Nginx HTML uh, folder, which is where we serve static file in the Nginx server. And then one last thing we can do. Um, so you can see here we have this ng build. We can also pass in a configuration for production. So I can copy this and then paste it here and then pass in production. So whenever we run ng build, you can add as many of these scripts as you want. But since I'm going to be running ng build or npm run build for this script, then it's going to run this command, which in this case will set the configuration to product. And I'm going to show you why we're setting this to production. Actually, this can be any name that you want. It doesn't have to be production, but I'm going to show you how we're going to use this in an environment because we can have different environment whenever we're building the application, either for deployment for production or deployment for development, whatever the case might be. And Angular can switch different environment files and then apply the properties in these files whenever you run the application in a specific environment. So that's what I'm going to show you how to do next. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just uh, collapse this. Actually, I can just delete this folder altogether. So let's just go here and I'm going to do remove recursive force verbose so that I can see everything and I'm going to pass in distribution. So that's going to remove this folder and everything inside. it. So I'm going to press enter and you can see it's removed, clear the screen. And if I go back, this folder is removed from here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go inside of the source folder and then I'm going to create another folder and then I'm going to call it environment. So before, by default, whenever you use the Angular CLI to create an Angular application, this folder would be created by default, like it would be here by default with the Angular CLI. But for some reason, they don't do that anymore, but you can still use it as you can see that I'm doing here. I'm defining it manually. And then inside of here, we can have environment dot ts and then we can have another file, which is going to be the environment dot prod. So here we can say environment dot prod dot ts. So we have two environment files, one for development. You could name this environment dot dev dot ts. It's really up to you. So but this used to be the default that comes with the Angular CLI whenever you build an Angular application with the ng new command. That's no longer the case and I have no idea why. So inside of the environment dot ts file, we can just define a simple uh, object. So we're going to say export cost and then we're going to say environment. And then we're going to set it equal to an object. And then all we have to do is to define whatever we want. But one thing that's really important is the production flag. So we can say production and we need to set this to false because Angular is going to need to read this 
to determine what it needs to do with this file. So we're going to set this to false and then we need to pass in the API underscore base underscore URL. I'm going to set this to whatever we have inside of the service. So inside of the service, remember in the customer service, we have this string here. So we don't need to pass this in like hard coded like this. So I'm going to cut it and then put it in here. Okay, so this is going to be the environment of my local computer. So this computer, that's where the backend application is running. So you can see here. Okay, so that's running on my local computer. If I scroll up, you'll see, oh, there it is. Start an application on port 8080. And I know the IP address of this computer is this IP address that you can see here, 192.168.1.209. That's my local IP address. And another thing worth mentioning is I'm using the local IP address because this is going to be deployed in a Docker container. And by default, Docker is going to define a bridge network. And a bridge network has a switch that connects to your local network so that this application will be able to resolve this IP address. Okay, so don't put local host in here. Just get the IP address on your local Local network and then pass it in here instead. If you put local host, then it's going to look at the host container, which is not going to work for you. Okay, so make sure you put the IP address in here. So in the regular environment file, we just define production to be false and then pass in everything else that we want. In this case, we just have one other environment variable, which is the API based URL, and I'm defining it here. So now all I can do is just copy everything here and then go to the prod paste and then just change this to true. So that's the prod. In our case, the URL is going to be the same. So we're just going to keep the same URL. So now inside of the customer service, we need to pass in this environment variable coming from this environment. So also notice they have the same name. So API based URL and also in the production, it's API based URL. In our case, it doesn't really make sense because the URL is the same. But just imagine that inside of the production environment, so this file right here, this was pointing to the production URL. So it's Angular that's going to do the switching for these files and use the different environment variables. So now we're going to go inside of all of our service and then just read that environment variable from the environment file. So instead of passing an empty string, I'm just going to call the environment. So we're going to see the environment as you can see here, and then we're going to pass in the API based URL. Okay. It's the same name. This is really important. And then we're going to do the same for the, we don't have anything in the service that's making HTTP call, nothing in the notification service either, but we do have something we can call in here. And we're just going to change that as well and make sure we import the environment. Okay. So we import the environment coming from the environment. So the one for the dev or the non prod, but whenever we run the ng build with the prod flag, then it's going to do the switching for us. So now this is all good. I'm going to close these files and there's one last configuration we have to do um, before when you create an angular application with the angular CLI. So using angular ng new command, it would do all of this for you. And they changed it in these newer versions of Angular. So I'm not sure why, because I still use um, this setup the way it is. Maybe it's because they want to start off with less files and you just define these if you want them. So this might be the reason. But in any case, we need to go inside of the angular.json file and tell Angular about the switching of these files. Otherwise, it's not going to do that. So you want to go inside of your angular.json file and also, by the way, this is a very important file for the Angular ecosystem or an Angular application, this file right here, the angular.json file. So instead of that file, we want to scroll down and then go to configuration. And in configuration, you can see we have the production object here. It only has the budget. So instead of here, we can do something called a file replacement. So we're going to do file replacement. You can see it coming up here and it's on array. So in here, we're going to say we want to replace. So we're going to say replace. We want to replace something in the source forward slash environment forward slash environment that TS. I think I need to rename these. So instead of the source, this is supposed to be environment. So let's rename this to environment. Okay. So because it's multiple environments, so this is supposed to be environment. So source environment, and then we want to switch the environment.ts file to a new file, which in this case is going to be, oops, the prod file. So we just copy this and then change it to prod.ts. And then we want to say with very intuitive. So we say for file replacement, which is a configuration we're giving to this angular.json file, look for this file, replace it with this file. And we want to do this when the configuration is production. Okay. 
So instead of the production object, this yellow open curly brace is here. So when the configuration is production, configuration, production, switch the environment file to the prod. Okay. So that's all we have to do here. And I think we should be good to go. Now everything should work just fine. The only thing we have left to do is to create the Docker compose file just to make it easier to run containers using this Docker image. And this is going to be just like a few lines of code. So let's go ahead and work on that right now. So I'm going to go ahead again, uh, click in this file explorer here and then create a new file. This time it's going to be the Docker compose file. So we're going to say Docker compose.yaml, press enter. And then we're going to define our services. So we're going to say services. And then we're going to say, this is the secure capita. So that's the name of the service. And then we need to pass in a container underscore name. Uh, we can say secure capita app container. This is a long name. I should change this also to app. This is a weird name because we have like two A's touching each other. So you can come up with a better name. So we're defining our services. And the first one is going to be the secure capita or the only one because that's the only service that we're going to have in here. The container name, whenever the container is created, it's going to be secure capita app container. And then we're going to define the build. So we're going to say build a dot to denote the current directory because that's where the Docker file is. If the Docker file wasn't a folder, we would say, you know, folder name, folder that blah, blah, blah. Okay. In our case, it's in the same directory. So we just put a dot and then the image is going to be a uh, secure copy app v1 like version one or latest if you want. And then we're going to define some port. So we're going to say ports, which is on array. And then we're going to say we're going to map 80 to port 80. So map 80 on the container, which we're exposing here because that's what Nginx use. We're also mapping it to port 80 on the host. Okay. And we expose also that same port and also define a network. So networks, and this is going to be the same network. So internal net, and then I need to define this network. So we're going to say network or networks. And then we're going to give it the same name. So copy paste, we can give it a driver. So we're going to say driver bridge. That's the default anyway, but I just like to specify it. So all this is going to do when we run Docker compose up, it's going to look at this Docker file, build an image and then run the containers expose these ports. So that's all we have to do for this Docker compose file. As you can see, it's just really just 16 or 15 lines of code. And that's all we have to do here. So everything is pretty much done. The only thing we have to do now is to run this container and see everything in action. And that's what we're going to be working on next. So the last thing that I want to show you is how to get rid of all these errors that we've been seeing in the application. So let's close everything here and I'm just going to bring back the terminal and then we're going to run the application again, just so that we can see them. So I'm going to do ng serve and then let this finish. Okay. So it's over and you can see we have all of these warnings for external dependencies. And all we need to do is to pass them in as we are going to allow them as common uh, JavaScript dependencies. So we have to go back to the application and open the angular.json file. And we already started doing this. We just didn't finish it. So let's scroll up a little more. So you can see here we're passing in the JSPDF. So the JSPDF is a library that we brought in to help us uh, with the PDF generation. So what we want to do is to also pass in the file saver. That's another library that we brought in. Let me see if I can grab the package.json file and put it on the side. So if you scroll down in our dependency, we have this one, which is an external JavaScript dependency. So we are allowing it as an external Java dependent, uh, JavaScript dependency. Also the file saver. So I'm passing in the file saver. But the thing with this is it also sometimes complain for dependencies of these dependencies. So if JSPDF or file saver has a dependency on some other library, then sometimes it's going to complain for it as well. So all you have to do is to just look inside of the terminal and see what those dependencies names are and then just pass them inside of this array. So let's go back and scroll up. So you can see they're still here, but I'm going to stop and rerun. I'm going to fast forward the video so that you don't have to wait for this. And if I scroll up, 
So it's over. We still have some. And if I scroll up, you can see now it's complaining for this core JS module. So you can see core, core, core. All of these are core. And then there's a RAF, and then there's a RGB color, and then there's this uh, DOM purify, and then this HTML canvas. So we just need to pass all of these in. So let's do Control C. So I'm just gonna copy them one by one, and then I'm just gonna put them in. So I'm gonna copy this core JS thing, go back, go here, get another entry in this array, which is core JS. Oops, I don't need this single quote. And then we're gonna do it for the next one which is RAF. So copy that, go back, pass in RAF. And then we need to do it for RGB color, copy that, and then pass this in here. And also for the uh, this dump purify, copy that. I can close this now and pass it in here. And lastly, we're gonna do it for the HTML to canvas, so copy that. And then we're gonna paste it in here just like that. Okay, so now it shouldn't complain anymore. So let's just give it a try here, just to make sure we're good. So ng serve, and then let it finish. All right, and you can see now we don't have these warnings anymore. So it's really just look at the warnings, just see what the dependency is. Sometimes it's not the dependency that you install, but a dependency of the dependency that you install. So just grab the name and then put it in the allowed common JS dependency, as you can see. And I know I say I would do this, uh, I just keep forgetting, but that's how you solve this. Okay, so now everything looks clean and it just make you feel good because I was having a hard time dealing with this uh, errors all the time. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is to just run this container using this Docker file and the Docker Compose and then see everything in action. So that's what we're gonna be working on next. So I log into my Linux computer and I actually log inside of another machine, which is the same one that I was using to deploy the backend because that's where I have Docker install. So if I do Docker, it's gonna give us something because I have Docker install. And if I clear the screen and I do uname dash A for example, you can see that I'm using a Linux computer. So obviously it's not this Mac that you're looking at. I'm just SSHing inside of this computer that you can see here. Okay, so that's why I have Docker install and I have also uh, added the application in there so we can do secure capita just so that we can go inside of this application. And if I do an LS here, you can see we have all of our files. So the Docker file is here and the Docker Compose file is also here. So now all we have to do is to run the Docker Compose command and then launch this Docker container. So I'm gonna do docker-compose-dash up dash d and then we need to pass in dash dash build because we have a docker file that we need to build so the same command that we use in the back end we're just going to use the same one here so what this is going to do is just going to create the docker image and then run that image with the configuration that we gave it instead of the docker compose file so i'm going to go ahead and press enter and we're just going to let this finish this can take a minute because it needs to pull images from the internet so let's just give this a second to finish everything is finished you can see we have these steps that we ran and the docker image was created the container was started and the network was also created so now i'm going to go ahead and clear the screen and just do docker ps and we want to grab for the secure copy that so i can just say secure and then press enter as you can see here it says it's up 26 seconds ago so it's up and running and another thing I can do is I can do Docker logs and then look at the logs. So in this case, I can pass in the ID of that container. So that ID that you see here, or I can pass in the name of the container, which is the secure capita app container. And also I want to point out, you can see the image that was used is the secure capita app version one, which is the image that we specify and the Docker compose file. So the name of the image. So if you want to see the log, we can do secure capita app container. And you can see these are the logs coming from inside of that container here. So if we go to the browser and we and just access the IP address of this computer, we don't even have to pass an 80 because that's the default for HTTP. Then we should be able to see our application. So I'm gonna clear the screen again and then do hostname dash I so that we can see the IP address of this computer. So the first two IP addresses, and those are the one that we're interested in. Everything else that you see here, this is just IP addresses coming from the, the Docker engine. And the reason I have two IP addresses is because I have this computer connected to the Wi-Fi 
and also to the uh, network using a cable. So I can just copy this right here. Oops, I didn't mean to do that, but I need to copy this. And then I'm gonna open my browser and I'm gonna bring it over here. So we need to go to 192.168.1.164 or 216, it should give us the same thing. So if I press enter here, you can see the application is running. So it's deployed using Docker and it's asking me to log in. Now remember, this is using the backend that is connected to my computer running on the same network because I didn't pass in localhost. So I should be able to access this application if I use the same credential. Oh, now outlook gmail.com and then one, two, three, four, five, six. So if I press enter and just give this a second and you can see that I logged in successfully. So now we know that everything is working and the application has been containerized. So I can go to my profile, I can update the information, I can do everything that I was doing before. So everything should work as expected. You can see I can update my MFA, I'm gonna disable that. I can go to my profile and uh, make an update here and then I can save. Everything should work as expected. I can also update the customers so you guys can feel free to change whatever you want. I'm gonna change this to Gmail, update. I'm just doing random stuff at this point because you know, uh, if I do Rick, you can see that everything is working. Go back to the home page. So the application has been fully containerized and everything should be working as expected. You shouldn't have any problem. Now there's one thing that I do want to show you and I'm gonna show it to you right now. So if you look here, you can see that I'm looking at the specific IP address because I'm in the root or the home page of the application. So if I refresh this, you'll see that the application just refreshed like normal. However, if I, for example, go to my profile and I try to refresh the application, you can see now I get this 404 not found. Now, this is a problem that you probably gonna find in all of the main frameworks, the JavaScript framework, so Angular, React.js, and also Vue, because the navigation is done in the front end and not in the back end. And what happens when we try to refresh the page and we go to forward slash profile or forward slash anything for that matter, we get a 401 not found because the Nginx server could not find this path on the server. So what the browser did, the browser sent this request all the way back to the server, requesting a file by that name, which doesn't exist because this is a single page application. We only have one index file. So it's Angular with the browser that is managing this navigation, or in other words, just JavaScript that is managing the navigation. It's looking at this path and then deciding what piece of UI to show in the application, which is why it works. Uh, like if I refresh the home page, which is gonna serve the index file by default. And also if I click on a link, which is being managed by the Angular router, so Angular knows exactly what I'm trying to do, so it takes me there. But when I refresh the browser, the browser actually sent this request all the way back to the server, so the Nginx server, requesting a file by that name profile, which doesn't exist, which is why when refresh, not found. So there are many ways that you can handle this, but we're just gonna do it the simple way, which is to always serve the index file, no matter what path that is served here. So this is a problem that I had for a while and I was using the Apache server before and I fixed it on the Apache server and now I'm using the Nginx server and I also fix it on the Nginx server. So you cannot deploy your application this way. So for example, if I look at this first customer here and then I refresh the page and then the page is broken. So obviously you cannot have your application this way. So that's what I'm gonna show you how to fix in the next lecture. And if you wanna go back to have the application running so that you can see something, you just have to go back to the root. So this root right here and then refresh it because in this case, the browser is gonna request the index file index.html, which we do have on the Nginx server, which is really the only file that we have. So if I refresh this, you can see now it works. So I'm gonna show you how we can fix this problem. It's really just a simple fix, but it's really important because you can't have your application breaking like this. So that's what I'm gonna show you how to fix next. And this fix is gonna work for React.js and possibly for Vue. I haven't worked with Vue at all, so I'm not entirely sure, but single page application JavaScript frameworks will have this problem. So this problem exists in Angular, it also exists in React.js, and I'm gonna show you how to fix it using just the Nginx server. For the Apache server, it's a little bit different because the configuration is totally different, but the solution is similar. You just want to always serve that one index.html file because that's the only file that we have in the Nginx server. All the other files are JavaScript file and the browser cannot serve these files. The browser can read these files, but it cannot serve them and then show them as the uh, UI. So that's what we need to fix. So I'm gonna go back to the terminal, 
and we're going to go ahead and take a look at this. So what we need to do, we need to go inside of the container. So if I go up a little more and we're going to grab this container. So the secure copy that container, press enter. So you can see that we have this container running, right? So that's the application that we have run. So now we need to go inside of this container and we can do that using the Docker exec command. And then we pass in the interactive mode and we pass in the name of the container. So the secure copy that container, and then we want to execute the bash shell. So to do this, we just do bin bash bash, which is the location of the shell. And then we're going to press enter. You can see now my prompt just changed because now I am inside of the container. So I'm going to clear this. And if I do LS, you can see that we have some files in here. And I'm also going to see if I can minimize this. Okay, just so that we can see this a little better. And then I need to go inside of the forward slash Etsy. And we want to go to the Nginx. And if I list everything in here, you can see we have this conf.d. So that first folder here, right here. And that's what we need to go into. So I'm going to do cd conf.d and then ls. So you can see in here we have this default that configuration. So that's a configuration that nginx is using. And also if we go to the main configuration, so this nginx config right here. Uh, let's see if I have vim. So nginx. Okay, I don't have vim. Let's do update so that we can well, we need to do apt update because I need to install vim. So otherwise we won't have any text editor. So I'm going to do apt install vim. You can install nano if that's easier for you. But at this point, you're inside of a container. So now you really will see why um, you need to, uh, to some level, be able to use the terminal because I cannot use VS code inside of the Dagger container. So let's clear this in LS again. So we need to go into this um, Nginx configuration. So this is the configuration. And you can see at the very bottom, if I scroll to the bottom, you can see here they're including everything that is inside of the conf.d folder. Okay, so everything that we put inside of this folder will be included in this file. So what this means is that we don't have to touch this file directly. I mean, we can, but we don't have to. So if I ls again, so we don't have to touch this file, we just have to put whatever configuration we want inside of this folder. So if I list everything inside of this folder, you can see it's gonna look for everything that ends with conf and then included inside of this file, which is what I just showed you. So if I do nl nginx, if I don't know if I oh I have nl. So you can see here at the very bottom on line 20, that's what it's doing. Say include everything inside of this itsy nginx conf.d, everything that ends with conf. In that case, this file will be included inside of this configuration. So let's see what's inside of this file. So I'm going to clear the screen again and then oops, I'm going to go up. So ls, we want to go inside of the conf.d and then ls and then vim go to this. File. And I'm going to go here, well not here. I'm going to go down here and then I'm going to say try underscore files and again I'm going to put a dollar sign and I'm going to say uri. And I'm going to say forward slash index that HTML and then put a semicolon. So every time that it cannot find a file, it's going to go ahead and try this index file. So in this case, that's always going to return the index file whenever it cannot find the file. And then Angular will handle the route that is present in the URL bar in the browser so that we don't have this problem anymore. So we're just telling Nginx to try the index file whenever it cannot find the file that is being requested by the browser. So try files dollar sign URI and then forward slash index.html. So now I can save and quit and I'm going to exit out of here and then I'm going to clear this and then we're going to restart the container so I can say Docker restart and then we're going to say secure copy and then press enter and then now we can do Docker PS and then grab that secure copy that again and you can see now it's running. So I'm going to bring back the browser and I'm going to move it over here. And if I refresh this, everything should work as expected. But now if I, for example, go to my profile and I refresh the page, you can see that it's not giving me this for one. Not. Okay. So if I can keep refreshing it, you can see that it still works the same and I can update my information. Well, let me just delete this part so that you can see an actual update. So I can update that and it should work the same. I can go to the customers again. I can update them. Everything should work as expected. Okay. And well, if I go to this customer again and then refresh the page, I can, I can keep refreshing it. It's not giving me this now because it's returning the same index file. 
and then Angular is handling the route that is present here. Okay, so that's what we have to do for this. And the last thing that I want to show you is you saw that to fix this problem, we have to go inside of the container and update a specific configuration file. So that is definitely a lot of work. So what I'm going to show you is how you can just create that configuration and then you can just copy that file over whenever you're going to build the Docker image and then run the container so that you don't have to, you know, separately go inside of the container and then do that every time. Obviously that wouldn't be a good idea. So that's what I'm going to show you how to do so that we don't have to do this manually. I'm just going to show you how we're going to take that config file and then just copy it in that particular location so that we don't have to deal with this problem in the first place. So that's what I'm going to show you how to do right now. So I'm going to go back to the terminal and what I'm going to do is do Docker dash compose down. So it's going to destroy everything. So it's going to stop the containers and then remove these containers. Now I'm also going to remove the image. So I'm going to say Docker image RM and then I'm going to say secure copy that version one and then remove it. I think you can do Docker RMI for remove image. That should work as well. I'm going to say Docker image prune so that we can remove any dangling image and then I'm going to say Docker network prune it's gonna do the same thing so clean any dangling image and networks that we weren't using and then clean this so at this point this application should be broken so if i go back and refresh the page you can see it's broken and we clean everything so back in the terminal i just need to go inside of the docker file so i'm gonna say vim and then docker file and then I'm going to scroll down. So whenever we get the Nginx image, I want to go ahead and then copy the configuration file. So to do this, I'm going to say copy and I'm going to copy a file named default.conf. Okay. And we need to copy this file in that same location. So we're going to say etc forward slash Nginx forward slash conf dot D. Okay. So we're just going to copy this file inside of this folder. Now we don't have this file yet, but I'm just going to show you what that file will look. So I'm going to save that. So we're technically doing everything else, but the only difference is after we get the Nginx stable image. So that's happening on line eight. As you can see, I'm highlighting here. Then we're going to copy this configuration file that we don't have yet, but we're going to create it, which I'm going to call default.conf. And we're going to copy it over to that particular location because we know that's where it belongs. So I'm going to save this and then I'm going to quit and then I'm going to create this file. So I'm going to say vim. And I'm going to say default.conf. So this is the file you can see at the bottom that we just created this file. And then I'm just going to go ahead and paste it just so you can see what it looks like. So this is what the file looks like. It's literally the same configuration. I just really copied it from inside of the container and then I just paste it here. And then I just add this line on line nine. So we just say try files, dollar sign URI, and then the index.html. So that way we know that whenever we're going to run this Nginx container, it's going to copy this configuration file. And it's going to make that one change on line nine so that we don't have to do it ourselves. As you can see that I'm highlighting because it's going to override the existing file that is going to come with the container image itself. So we're just overriding that one line, as you can see here, everything else is the same. OK, and I don't think we need that part here at the bottom because we don't have any 500 HTML file that we return, but I just left them here. It doesn't really matter. But if you want, you can clean this up as well. This is what's really important, that location and all the way to the closing curly bracket here. And we just added this line nine. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. And also, if you want, you can remove this index that HTM. So I can just really remove that because we only have the index HTML. We don't have any HTM file. Okay. So always serve the index that HTML. And if you can find anything, just return the index HTML again so that Angular can handle the routing in the front end. So I'm going to save that and quit. And if I ls everything, you can see now we have the configuration file. So the default.conf. And if I nl the Docker file, so Docker file, you can see we're copying this file. So the default.conf, this file right here, and its location, which is the Etsy, Nginx, and then the conf. So all we have to do now is to just run this command again, and everything should work as expected. But this time, when we refresh the application on a particular route, it's not going to give us this 404. So I'm going to go up and then run this command again. Okay, so this is the command. And then I'm just going to run it, and then we're going to let it finish. All right, so let's just give it a second. All right, everything is completed. I'm going to include this one more time. I'm going to do Docker PS, and then we're going to grab secure, press enter. 
you can see it's up and running. So now let's bring the browser. Just gonna move it over here and I'm just gonna make it full screen and then reload. You can see we're back in. And if I go to my profile, for example, and then I reload, you can see it's still working as expected because we pass in the configuration in, so we didn't have to do it manually. And that's typically what you wanna do, but I wanted to show you the solution because it's really important that you understand how all these things work. So let's go back to the terminal and let's just go inside of the container again so that we can confirm. So if I go up, some more where we go inside of that container so right here and we want to go to etsy let's see we want to go to nginx ls so you can see the conf so that folder right here that's where we need to go so conf d clear that one more time ls so this is the file that we overwritten so i can do nl uh, I don't know if I have that installed but let's see okay so you can see this is our file because we overrode this file when we copy it to that particular location in the Docker file. Okay, so this location right here that we have in the Docker file, which is where we are, okay? So we have this in there now, so we don't have to worry about going in there and do it manual. And if you wanna know how to do the same thing in Apache, um, I can probably give you the file because before I was using Nginx, I was using Apache for this. I just recently started using Nginx. So if you want the configuration, the same configuration for Apache, just let me know. I can just send you the configuration that you need to add and I'll tell you uh, where you need to put it. Okay, so that's all we have to do here. And if you have any questions, let me know. I think that's everything that I wanted to cover when it comes to deploying the front end application. And if I go back again, you can see everything is working as expected. I can save my information. I can uh, change my authorization. I can save, update. Everything should work as expected. I'm going to make me a super admin again. Okay, sysadmin and update my profile. I can go to the customers. I can create a new invoice. If I want it, I can add a new invoice here and then select the customer. I can go to the invoice. I don't have an invoice, but you guys feel free to test that. But everything should work. And then I can also access the customers. I can update their information, blah, blah, blah. So everything is working as expected. So if you just want to test this, you can create an EC2 instance on AWS or Microsoft Azure. Just get some server in the cloud that you can use and then you can install Docker on it and then you can deploy your application. I already showed you guys how to pass sensitive information to the Docker Compose in the Docker file when we were deploying the backend. So you can use the same logic and then pass in sensitive information, but you don't save them in any of the config file. But that's all I wanted to show you. Obviously, that doesn't really have anything to do with the application that we build in this course, but it's also important that you know how to work with Docker because Docker is like super popular and it solves a lot of problems that developers used to have. So it's a very important piece of technology that you should know in this day and age when it comes to software development. So I hope this was useful to you. And if you have any questions, just ask me in the Discord and I should be able to help. And I'll see you guys in the next one.